started and um, Rachel's going to help us by letting people in as they uh, they straggle into the lecture today. Um, good afternoon and, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Shelby Doyle and I'm an assistant professor of architecture and co-chair of the College of Design Lecture and Exhibitions Committee. And I'm really pleased to introduce you to today's speaker. Cordine Lewis Allen is founder and CEO of Youth Design Center in Brooklyn, New York. The title of his lecture today is Youth Design Center Designing for Equity. Lewis Allen has over a decade of interdisciplinary design experience working across public and private sectors at the intersection of tactical urbanism and social activism through community led design. Youth Design Center, formerly made in Brownsville, provides a gateway for young people in his native Brownsville, Brooklyn, to access education, technology, and mentorship to tackle underrepresentation in STEAM professions and cyclical poverty, as well as to address the need for place based community revitalization. The center has been featured in the New York Times, Bass Company, BuzzFeed, and Forbes. Lewis Allen has taught architecture as an adjunct faculty member at City College of New York and was a human in residence at the New York University Tisch Interactive Telecommunications Program. He serves on the board of the Brownsville Community Development Corporation and the Ocean Hill Brownsville Coalition of Young Professionals. He is an Emerging Leaders Fund recipient a 2018 Cranes New York Business 40 Under 40, a 2017 Forbes 30 Under 30, a 2018 America's Promise Alliance People of Promise awardee, and a 2016 Echoing Green Black Male Achievement Fellow, amongst many other accolades. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Architecture from SUNY Buffalo and a Master of Architecture from Harvard Graduate School of Design. Please join me in welcoming Courtney Lewis Allen by either sharing a clapping reaction in Zoom or turning on your camera and actually clapping so that we can um, welcome him to Iowa State, albeit virtually. So with that, I'm going to mute and pass over the lecture to Courtney. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here. Um, and I love a good virtual clap. Um, so thank you for that. Um, so yeah, I, um, as stated, I am a native of uh, Brownsville, Brooklyn, New York, and I rep it everywhere I go. So I start with that. Um, uh, the Youth Design Center is something that's very close to my heart, um, coming from the neighborhood, and so I'm excited to talk about it. Um, so one of the first things that I think about when I have these conversations around equity in, in our communities is um, starting from a place of, of shared understanding um, and, and uh, that we we have to admit that there's a problem um, in the ways in which we address uh, community uh, engagement and social activism, um, particularly um, if you look top down from um, the government's perspective and how uh, they're uh, they go about engaging with us um, in communities, uh, particularly communities of color, um, we kind of end up on a map with dots uh, and stickers rolled up under a desk in a municipal building um, after the engagement process is done. And there's not really an active living uh, uh, um, uh, body uh, entity that is engaged in sustaining uh, the relationships and the work that's built into those types of plans. Um, and I think that there's something to be said about that and, and what where our plans as architects end up <laughs> um, rolled up in, or flat inside of like metal bins and offices after we're done with the building. Um, and we're not kind of like checking up on it afterwards. Uh, you know, just, you know, are things going okay? You know, do people um, completely hated? Uh, is there a corner that's not being used? Those types of things. Um, it, and it's it's very transactional, right? And I, and I think that that's been a part of um, kind of like what we were taught or what we were taught in school sometimes. Um, at, at least for me, part of my uh, education 
you know, I felt like I was at a scale that was uncomfortable for me <laughs> as a designer. Obviously, understanding that I need to learn the multiple scales in which uh, architects have at their disposal to uh, communicate uh, intention. Um, but th this, you know, this scale for me was out of touch. And this is like a uh, back, back bend uh, museum that I had done in grad school. Um, but I felt uh, actually more in, in tune with this type of intervention, which was like a, probably the first project that I did in, in grad school, um, which was a, a kind of like a, a stitching uh, or weaving together uh, uh, in the interstitial space between uh, two existing bu uh, buildings, um, some new type of space for inhabitation. And, that, um, and so it kind of like left room for sitting, standing, playing, uh, de dealing with the human body and, and, and the ways in which uh, it occupies and maneuvers space and, and deals with light and those types of things. And so I like that scale. Um, and I thought about that scale a lot, <laughs> and even in the projects that um, did not um, uh, lend themselves to the, <laughs> to the scale. Um, and uh, particularly as it pertains to my community. So this is, this is the image on the left is the, uh, 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 Brownsville House is a building, a series of, the first public housing that was built in Brownsville, Brooklyn. In Brownsville, we have the highest concentration of public housing in the nation. And um, this building is a series of 37, 38 buildings that were first built, kind of like low rise, you'd walk up, um, know your neighbor in the corridor. Uh, you know, this, these were buildings that people wanted to live in when they were built. Um, our pu public housing authority is called NYCHA, New York, um, City Housing Authority, if I use the acronym again, it's, that's what it is, NYCHA. Um, the, and, 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 and then they started to proliferate <laughs> through urban renewal, the destruction of blocks and blocks uh, to build um, these, these buildings. And so I, uh, I initially got interested in, in design because I was thinking about the interstitial spaces between them and the, the green spaces of the campuses that aren't being used and the street fronts that um, felt uh, and that they weren't lively. Um, and this was a sketch that I did, I think as like, you know, just kind of thesis diagram or a party, I suppose, if, um, um, to say, okay, well, our community doesn't have uh, uh, um, the attractive housing stock that some of the other communities, the Brownstone Belt neighborhoods in, in Brooklyn, for instance, like Bed-Stuy and Park Slope and uh, uh, Cobble, Cobble Hill and, and the like have, you know, what does that look like to have a vernacular architecture, um, you know, inter, intersect or you know, weave into and build, build back the store, street fronts within our, our um, community. Uh, so that involves like breaking up the super blocks and like lining the streets with with houses um, and also kind of like dealing with the tower and the parts uh, that were, were were left behind and kind of like uh, glitter the landscape landscape uh, um, in the in the NYCHA campuses. Uh, but in the in the act of doing that, thinking about economic mobility and how you might you know tear tear off the first eight floors of a building. Um, and display those people into uh, instances, uh, uh, houses that they can own or rent to own over time, right? Um, and then there still be a surplus of other buildings that you can sell at market rate to pay for the, the new construction of uh, all the other things that were being proposed in this uh, plan that I had in my thesis. Very aspirational, very naive of me, because when you, when you get down to the, the nuts and bolts of it, uh, NYCHA has a $40 billion uh, 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 capital budgets deficit or need rather. Um, it's not, that's not a small number. Um, it, for, for, for scale, um, HUD's budget this year is 47 billion. HUD, like <laughs> the whole of HUD. <laughs> so, so that's just in, in, in pretty deep. And so uh, it takes a lot more than thinking about this in this scale to kind of like, uh, solve some of the underlying issues in, in community. And, and sometimes, uh, you know, in, in some respects, it takes a lot less. So that's one of the first problems that, you know, we need to admit that there, there is, is that, you know, the alignment of architectural education maybe leads to 
grander thinking that doesn't necessarily solve immediate problems. Um, this was another problem that needed to be admitted ar around the diversity or lack thereof in, in um, multiple professions um, in design and technology. And that's something that I had sought to, uh, to uh, investigate as to really just to understand why I was the only uh, a black guy in my class and in most of my schools and, and offices that I worked in. So um, the, uh, the other you know, problem that I noted when I was talking to folks in, in, in community and working uh, in the nonprofit um, was the lack of, uh, uh, or rather the, uh, that one in four young people were not in school, not working in my community. And, and that seem to be a, a, a major indicator of, of uh, public safety issues and as well as the, you know, uh, uh, indicator of, of poverty within the community. So, um, so I, through multiple kind of like streams of, of uh, kind of like in academia and as well as just in practice while working for these nonprofits, um, I realized that the, the, the most important voice was the hyper-local voice that knew very intimately what the, 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 um, the issues were. Um, but we didn't necessarily have the space for that con those conversations to be ongoing. And I thought that that was a challenge, right? Like the rolled up papers under the desks is the, is the problem. When the conversation leaves the community, like it's, it's, it's hard to um, uh, maintain momentum as well as build um, build plans. So, uh, so I, I had um, was into founding, uh, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But we did a pop up, this activation space to understand whether a thing like Made in Brownsville or Youth Design, Youth Design Center needed to exist, um, called it the labs. Um, and it was a space for conversation and uh, asking our neighbors questions and kind of like a, uh, a walking museum uh, hopefully you can still hear me. It says my in walking museum of um, like public thought. And so, what 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 do folks want to see in the? What are your geniuses? What 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 share, skills do you have to share with other people? Um, what would help this corridor um, with revitalization? Uh, you know, this was like a, a a survey wall where you start at one end with a, a color a yarn that corresponds to your age. Um, like 14 to, to the, uh, 18 and you grab the yellow and you walk down and answer these questions by wrapping it around <clears throat> the uh the nails there so like what what job do you have now what do you want to be doing what's keeping you from getting there is it the lack of networks is uh, discrimination is the lack of experience um certification um if you had a million dollars what kind of business would you open up uh <laughs> you know tomorrow um, and the feedback that we're getting from this is, is that a lot of the folks in the community were creative if they, or wouldn't want it to be creative if they had the faculties to be creative. Um, and they wanted to open up like creative agencies, things that um, like video production shops, like they were already doing creative things in their, their free time that wasn't equating to dollars in their pockets. And, and a lot of them had intentions. So it, it validated some of the assumptions that we were making about um, you know, building a community design center. And this is not another shot like that. Uh, we also did surveys. We paid young people to go out with tablets and some gift cards uh, through the Small Business Services uh, Corridor District Needs Assessment um, that we had, had been commissioned to do. Um, and, and gift cards to local businesses, small businesses, to, to understand what corridor revitalization might look like um, along this stretch of uh, street called Belmont Avenue, which um, I'll show you a little later. Uh, but it's, it, it, it <clears throat> the feedback, you know, is really important to get from these like 150 people and, and the, you know, the 30 merchants along the corridor um, that spoke to like this once really thriving corridor you know, dying over time as they uh, decimated the community to build uh, uh, blocks and blocks of public housing and and in some blocks, nothing uh, that they left for vacant for 40 years. Um, <clears throat> the, um, the, the, the loudest feedback was that they want more opportunities for youth, more vocational programs, 
um, you know, other kind of like interesting things were like in, a, in three blocks, um, there are 10 churches, which led to, you know, very shuttered storefronts for most of the week. Um, and it, you know, it doesn't leave much to, to say about street activity and foot traffic um, for that street, if, if that's the case. So folks were asking for less churches, <laughs> um, you know, uh, you know and, and other basic things that sometimes other communities have like banks and uh, cafes and restaurants that you can sit down and, <laughs> and eat your food, God forbid. Um, but yeah, the, that, these conversations all kind of like validated the, the assumption that youth design center needed to exist. Um, and so our mission is to reduce the number of disconnected youth uh, by lowering the barriers to steam um, and increasing their uh, experience in the innovation economy. And so it's the first youth-led creative agency and, um, and innovation hub in East Brooklyn, which I'm proud of. And, and we work around um, marketable hard skills in steam, um, uh, educational attainment, economic mobility, and then the last piece about community-based uh, revitalization projects um, and to address the, the lack of equity in design and tech. Uh, we work predominantly with tw uh, 12 to 24 year olds um, to give them develop the skills in like graphic design, web design, videography, photography, um, uh, animation, 3D design, you know, architecture, lighting, fabrication and machining, blah, all that stuff. So, so our programs, um, you know, uh, range in, in scope. We have like the tech camps, we have free workshops and things, but our core program is that creative apprenticeship program. That's a paid program. They're getting paid to learn. We're, we're valuing their expertise in the community because they're local experts. Um, and we want them at the end of those, those cohorts to, to think about some of the solutions that they can be uh, implementing it, it, within their own communities, uh, uh, all the while giving them skills and lowering their inexperience and, and you know, <laughs> highly transferable, marketable skills in the tech and design industry. So a lot of them start their own businesses, about 50% of them, we've increased their, um, we've increased their um, monthly incomes uh, after the first six months of the, the program. Um, they're volunteering more, they're, you know, attaining higher, um, they're matriculating out of high school and, and, and uh, going into programs for advanced degrees or, in STEAM and in, in colleges, and then we pay them. We have a creative agency. We have a creative agency that um, clients come to us and our alumni freelancers are eligible to freelance for the creative agency um, that uh, where the young people can work on and continue to build their portfolios around client projects like logo design or uh, spatial design and uh, videography and the like. Um, and so this numbers, these numbers have actually doubled in the past year. Um, I guess I'll gotta update that slide. So, so this is all in the vein of uh, um, valuing the folks who are doing the work, like closest to the work and redistributing the, the power um, uh, around how um, they're engaged in the, in the processes of, of uh, space making, um, and, and developing kind of like plans for the future of their communities. Um, but with the underlying, you know, understanding that economic mobility is really the thing that keeps people in place and keeps people from being displaced because they're able to um, purchase land or homes, uh, open businesses within places that they want to be. Um, so that's really the underlying goal. But I just wanted to push that understanding uh, of my understanding of how gentrification uh, is to be curved in, in, in these communities. The, um, one of the uh, models that we really admire uh, out of uh, St. Louis, the uh, Creative Reaction Lab, a, a sister um, named Antoinette Carroll, who came up with this equity center community design uh, field guide, um, which, you know, there's a bunch of equity cent centered design um, precedents uh, this field guide I felt was super helpful in, in, in addressing some of the um, limitations of human-centered design um, and design thinking that don't necessarily take into account the histories of, of people and, and how they've been disconnected from power. <laughs> um, you know, the reason why the vacant lot exists is because the city didn't give folks who were asking for the, the lot um, access to it after they've asked years and years and years because they were holding on to it for you know, some RFP to come in the future that 
you know, only comes when there's uh, a mayoral push for X amount of, of, of a new public housing or um, new affordable housing units um, that then begs the question of, right? We've all heard those types of conversations, right? So, so that power was not given to the people um, but there's some great examples in Brownsville in which the, the pe people had to take the power in order to build <laughs> build um, housing. The Nehemiah houses uh, that were built by the East Brooklyn Congregation of Churches, um, really across uh, Brooklyn, Queens, and um, the Bronx, Nehemiah Foundation building these um, uh, small single-family homes, um, and now in the most recent decades, uh, uh, multifamily. To, on the vacant lots that the city left behind when they were doing urban renewal. Um, but yeah, this it's, it's, a, it's a great, uh, just this as a, as a guide, it's a great precedent uh, around some of the work that we've been doing and, and it's helpful for anyone who uh, just check out the Creative Reaction Lab, I always give her a plug. So the <laughs> free, free advertising for Creative Reaction Lab because I love them. Um, the uh, MGB Pops. So this was the first project that we um, took, our ear to the to the people and understood that this was out of every community meeting of a barrier for folks to be able to access economic mobility was just being able to access a storefront within the community on any any of the commercial corridors. Um, the landlords were charging like downtown Brooklyn prices for the space that's like not downtown Brooklyn. So it makes it, in, it impossible for uh, little little guys to open up shop and, and earn. Uh, earn a living. Um, so the city released the RFP, uh, the organization I was working for at the time uh, and several other consortium partners responded with a proposal to activate this vacant lot. Um, made in Brownsville, YDC, we were uh, contracted to do the uh, mural, um, but the lot was, uh, the plan was to give up folks an opportunity to have these kind of like kiosk work uh, retail spaces um, as well as like uh, shipping containers, retrofitted shipping containers for food vendors. Um, and this was also our first brick and mortar location, I suppose, <laughs> pre, -brick, pre brick and mortar location uh, where we sold products that the young people in our programs were, were creating. Um, so that's MGV Pops. And so this was in direct response to understanding that, you know, we, we, we should have the keys to this lot. We should be able to activate it in the ways that the neighbors saw is, is most most pressing and um, and working with neighbors and community to make that space possible. Another uh, project is Osborne Plaza. Uh, this is a street on uh, Belmont Avenue, as I mentioned before, where we did the corridor district needs assessment by, from the small business services. This is Belmont back in the, the 30s and 40s where there were push carts and, um, and a very lively street activity um, multi-story buildings that were all torn down um, in, during urban renewal from the 50s to the 70s. And um, they actually just very interestingly, a couple weeks ago, so, so the push carts had been um, uh, essentially criminalized. They, they required you, um, the people who um, got brick and mortars there's one, one shop called Slavens here that used to be a push cart. Then he got a brick and mortar and then started like a camp, you know, to, to push for the push carts to be um, uh, made illegal because they were uh, detracting from business, I suppose. Anyway, years later, this is what that corridor looks like. The city actually recently has increased the number of permits that folks can, street vendors can have in the city. So we're actually trying to get some of those permits designated for this, this area because um, we want you know, the old Belmont back, right? Um, but right now it has the highest co concentration of um, the highest number of vacancies and tenant turnovers is on this corridor in, in Brownsville, Brooklyn. And so it's the blue, it's the blue line here is that, that street, um, it's the, you know, the three blocks with the 10 churches. <laughs> um, and on the side of it is this uh, kind of like dead end street that's not really a cul-de-sac because it's not really a roundabout to turn around. That's created when they um, when they made the super box. <laughs> um, as you can see, the black in this, this map is uh, public housing. And so, you know, no eyes on there. There's like 
the side of a Jimmy Jazz and, and a daycare that's right there, but they don't have any public space to be to utilize. And so the young people realized that that, that was an asset that could be taken back and they proposed it being a public plaza um, that also dealt with some of the tensions that um, the street had historically had with young people from one housing development not getting along with the young people from another housing development and this being the space of confrontation for them. Right. So what does it look like if that space is a shared space and um, so they came up with these kind of like celebratory themes this kind of like Brownsville stronger together message and um, they went to the DOT and and got it approved with the art department and got the plaza designated. Um, and then there, there was the conversations about how to um, to keep that momentum around the plaza and the partners and, and uh, place place making activities that would happen to make it a vibrant place for the community. So this uh, campaign, the Beyond Belmont campaign was created, multiple events, partners um, and community, uh, all the partners along the corridor, the businesses were kind of rallied around um, to to offer discounts and things so that they can we can help to increase their foot traffic, um, and I should say the, the lead partner here is the Brownsville Community Justice Center. It's anytime you see people in purple shirts, it's the, the Brownsville Community Justice Center. They work with court-involved young people um, as alternatives to incarceration programming um, to get them uh, in, involved and invested in the community and, and to better their their lives and outcomes. And so these these where some of the shots from the street festivals, the Beyond Belmont street festivals at the, that have activated this corridor. There's been like food trucks and bouncy houses and um, game trucks and uh, you know, uh, mobile libraries and uh, face paintings and all the like, everything, you know, rock climbing. It's, it's, been, it's been a wild ride. It's been awesome. Um, so that happens on Belmont every year, about three times a year um, for the past six years, <laughs> uh, five, five, five years. Um, and then another phase is thinking about health and wellness and, and, um, and so the BCJC had been working with the health department around a historical model of uh, friendship benches, um, which are out of, uh, uh, let's say Tanzania, where in, in spaces where they don't have access to, um, you know, um, a facility for um, mental health uh, or psych psychologists or uh, psychiatrists, um, this this bench is there with a person, a clinician who can, uh, can talk to you if you wanted to, if you went to it, and it, it was seen to reduce the number of suicides and um, cases of depression in the area. So, um, so that model had been adopted by the um, mental health department of mental health and, and hygiene, and then they wanted us to work on some fresh designs for friendship benches and what that might look like for you know as relevant to this teen population where there's still kind of like historic beef and trauma and, and, and you know, loss of life. Um, um, but in the creation of the space, it's, it's supposed to be the anti that, right? So how, how do you get um, folks active and participating and talking to one another um, in and around these structures? So they came up with these puzzle pieces, they call the Osborne puzzle they come together to become a stage. So it's kind of like a, a platform for conversation or, or a performance. Um, but then when they're pulled apart, they're kind of like these um, mobile objects that can be used for like exercise or, you know, like balancing, they're kind of playful, but you need a buddy to move it. So that's kind of like the idea around the friendship um, piece and, and how they kind of occupy public space. There's also other ones that are like seesaw in the pavilion, there's like this, Fist that transmogrifies from a fist to a, a palm in the back there, and inside of it are some seesaw uh, friendship benches that uh, light up when you when you work on them. This is what they're working on here, um, and then there's also like an inflatable in the back. The younger kids like the infl inflatable, you know, when it's when it's when it's up, <laughs> um, when it's fully inflated. So uh, another project here is um, Marcus Garvey, Philip Departments. And well, Marcus Garvey Apartments now. So, so th this was a, a, a project. Was, the architect was um, Kenneth Frampton, who teaches at Columbia, um, wrote the book on modern architecture called Modern Architecture. Um, the, um, and MoMA, 
uh, uh, the, our Museum of, of Modern Art here in New York, um, oddly enough, the, and the Urban Development Corporation in 1970 came together as a response to the tower and the park typology, like the, creating this antithesis of that um, that came up with Marcus Garvey Apartments, Marcus Garvey Village at the time, um, as a low rise, high density housing. Um, and uh, I guess this is the best picture I have of it, but it's there in the background behind these young people. And they, these young people, it's 14 of them, they lived in this development. And so they were charged with kind of like thinking about under this new ownership, um, it had been sold to another developer. Um, it is not low income housing, it's, it's, um, or it's not, um, high, it's not public housing, but it's low to moderate income housing. <clears throat> Just to, it's, and it's right across the street from um, the Brownsville houses, for instance, the first building that I, I showed, that was a NYCHA building. Um, so they, they were charged with thinking about how um, they might intervene in some of the interstitial spaces that were not being utilized um, either by policy or power, right? Like there's, they're standing in a, a, a parking lot that the, the, the owners, the previous owners and the current owners say aren't being used, but there's chains that stop residents from being able to access the space and, um, and park in there. If they had access to the space, they would be parking in there. And that's predominantly what residents have been saying, but the um, management doesn't, doesn't listen. So all these understandings of like, you know, who really has the power in these places, these young people were learning that and how to subvert that and, and also to, to propose new thing, new relationships to power. Um, this is a map of them, uh, their understanding, their, not even their understanding, the way in which they navigate the community, right? The, they overlaid multiple maps uh, with a gradient from blue to where they felt safe walking to red is where they didn't feel safe walking. Um, and so, and then the green's kind of like the in between and we overlaid multiple layers of of their maps to to really see that like they felt safest in the areas where their their housing development was and then when uh the, this kind of like main drag this main corridor across the street from there is the brownsville houses and they don't get along with the kids over there so they can't walk over there and you know there's community centers over in that area um there's our offices over in that area so we we even had to bring programming to them <laughs> to, in order for them to access those of things they didn't have access to the computers that we had because of that this this these limitations where they can their physical bodies can go um and so these types of understandings are only things that you can understand once you have conversations and really intimately uh understand the the the, the how spatialized inequity kind of like manifests itself by the arbitrariness of, of uh what a building was called back in the 1940s when it was built <laughs> uh, or a series of buildings were, were called um so, so yeah, uh, and that's something, you know, eh. the, uh, um, so this, this was a proposal for one of the lots that they created, um, was thinking about a youth clubhouse because they didn't have access to some of the um, community center um, amenities and they wanted that access um, and a space to kind of like be entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial uh, teach each other skills, get, bring in people, contractors, consultants to teach them skills um, that could be used. Um, they actually showed it to Kenneth Frampton, which was interesting um, at Columbia. Um, was, you know, again, he was the original architect of the development. And Kenneth was like, um, you're not thinking big enough. And, and we're like, well, Kenneth, we don't have a bigger budget. Uh, so this is what we can build now you know, to instantiate some of the ideas that these young people have and to create um, you know, you, you were the one with the millions of dollars. Like, what do we have now uh, with, with our power and our resources to be able to instantiate something today, right? So this was the project that they were able to do in a, about a year and a half um, with the development support, with the resources that we had to give them this, 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 uh, the keys to um, this youth, um, youth clubhouse that they, they envisioned. And even things about the placement of like the containers were, were very intentional um, to shield the activity that's happening on the interior of the space from like passersby that you know are seen as the ops or the opposition that that lives across the street, such that you know they felt safe enough to occupy the space, right? Like they it was like you need to tilt this shipping container, <laughs> you need to sh shield what's happening on the inside with, uh, for our protection, so that we could use the space because if it's not, we're not going to go in there. Um, and and so those are design decisions that they. Um, 
you know, they they didn't know that they were designers until they started designing. And I, I think it's a very, um, um, you have to be very intentional about understanding the, the subtleties of, of young people and how they occupy public space, particularly in a place where we've had the highest number of stop and frisks um, in, in New York City, um, back when that was a thing under <coughs> Giuliani and um, Bloomberg. Um, so, you know, so the ways that their bodies navigate public spaces is, is very uh, uh, contested. Lastly, um, and yeah, lastly, the, this was a project that we just did last year uh, with Bronco Community Justice Center again, um, thinking about, again, uh, healing in public space and how uh, young people might create uh, interventions um, that in the times of, of social distancing and physical distancing still create moments of exchange, intimacy, uh, healing, uh, restoration um, for their neighbors, particularly when they're not able to see them. So they came up with these um, ideas for kind of like personal healing spaces that deal with the imagination and escape, uh, spaces for individual communities to uh, be immersed in the environment, to, to transform, to calm, to rejuvenate. Um, and then that's like the, the healing spaces or these heads, the, the personal healing spaces or, or these head spaces. And then another kind of like space is like this uh, retrofitted um, greenhouse, which is more around a healing sanctuary a community sanctuary for um, shared healing or self-expression and archiving of, of healings, right? Like telling stories or leaving stories or um, placing objects, memory objects, um, you know, leaving a note for somebody to, to, to be able to, to trip over or uh, not trip over, that's not safe, uh, see you later um, and telling stories. So, so those were, these were the, the kind of like parties <clears throat> um, for the, um, of personal healing spaces, uh, and then, then the, the you know the young people got to work. It was mostly young women that participated in the build out for this, which was awesome. The design team, I should say, is um, they're all a uh, woman led firm uh, called A plus A plus A, um, and they were fantastic. And <clears throat> and so this was uh, one of the head spaces that was more like a greenhouse um, escape with mirrored and, and trans uh, transparent. Um, ceiling. This was an immersive sound and light experience where you can um, plug up your Bluetooth um, phone uh, so that you play your own music and, and um, control the light. And this is more around uh, light refraction, um, kind of like silence. There's a, a speaker in there that kind of like drowns out the noise um, and, and kind of like plays with light and, and sound in that way. And then this was the sanctuary where you could um, kind of like listen to these tubes and hear this ohm, or you could speak into the tube and, and leave a secret or, or expel stress. Or um, um, There's a custom built uh, furniture in there. You know, you lift up a, a, a little drawer and you can leave a message. It auto records when you pick up the phone or lift up the, the drawer. Um, the shelves are meant to, to house these memory objects that folks want to leave in there. It's also spaces for post-its and, and the like. This is me listening to the Aum. Um, but yeah, this is, you know, and people were left a lot of like really. So these are these are meant to kind of like navigate for um, just healing. It also coincided with a um, an activation uh, with like Reiki and yoga <laughs> that was just like happening right behind this um, that the, the organization kind of like um, facilitated. Um, but these are meant to kind of like follow, go around the community um, in response to, to moments of trauma, you know, and, and, you know, if you think about the ways in which we memorialize people that are lost um, now in, in these spaces, right, like there's a little, um, there's candles that are left behind, sometimes uh, artifacts of those people, and those things sit out in the rain where they get, they get covered by a little box and, and get snowed on, you know, this is a way to respectfully, um, you know, house memory of people uh, within a place that uh, I feel like is more in, in tension and in tune um, with how we want to respect our, our those that we've lost. 
Um, so yeah, this is one of the messages and I'll leave it here. Um, as long as you're living, you have a purpose, so keep going. And that was from a young woman called, named Precious. And that is all for me. Thank you. If everyone could join me in another round of applause, the, the, the strange Zoom digital applause, it was a really powerful lecture. Thank you. I wish we could actually, you know, like make noise and you could hear us clapping, but you're going to have to imagine it. Um, thank you again. Uh, I think we have time for some questions and I have a few in the chat, but I think I have the power to unmute people. Um, so I think um, Carolyn Westor, you had a question. Are you still here? I know some people had to run to studio. She is not, but I'll, I can ask it. it Hi. Is, um, yeah. Oh, you're here. You I'm are, here. <laughs> I'm sorry. There's a lot That's of okay. okay. No, no problem. Um, it took me a few clicks to um, get unmuted. Um, yeah, thank you so much for your inspiring talk. I, I couldn't help but um, be struck by your description of the why um, uh, YDC um, and think of it as a model uh, for uh, for perhaps the um, outside the, an urban setting and I wonder if you could see it as a as working in a rural setting for example. Uh, well, if you talk to me, I, I which I guess you are the the I think every place that uh, every uh, young person deserves a, a space with resources and knowledge and. Um, and, and mentors to be able to cultivate, you know, their individual geniuses, and and that should be also if if where possible done hyper locally. I think that the the challenge with that, you know, in certain areas, obviously, is population size and um, some of the brain drain that happens in in certain areas uh, around the nation, and um, really also just understanding uh, where resources go and and. Um, uh, Within uh, states and cities, and how those are designated um, from municipality to municipality. So, um, the the model, our model, leverages public dollars really to to be able to do some of the work that a lot of the work that we do. Um, we do have a you know a revenue. Obviously, the revenue generating side is a creative agency, as well as something called YDC EDU, where folks can pay us to work with their youth populations. Um, and, but all of that combined is less than about one, well, it went up last year, but about a, a quarter of our income, the most, the rest of it is foundations. And if there's not that kind of like level of foundations and, and, and our corporate sponsors, if there's not that level of in, 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 in investment for sustaining these types of engagements. I think it's, it's, it's difficult for some, some rural areas. Do you have any questions from students? You can do a little like hand raise emoji if you want. And I think Rami, okay, how do I, let me see, ask to unmute. All right, you're up. Hi, uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Lewis, for a great lecture. I, I am really inspired by the work that you've done. I was wondering, in terms of engagement um, and engaging the community, how do you go by doing that in relation to uh, and relating it to policy decisions and whatnot? Do you guys like? I mean, I guess you see your approach is but more of a bottom approach than a top bottom, or is it like kind of a combined approach? Yeah. Um, thank you for the question. And in no way does um, YDC do it all. So obviously, in communities, there's always a uh, most times a, a network of folks that have expertise in in uh, and have been moving the needle for multiple things. We have a community board that has been advocating for multiple uh, for many things that you know we 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 do and continue to need in our community that gives a, a statement of needs every year to the city for resources to do those things. Um, I was a member of the community board. I was able to understand you know, what those, those needs are. We have a coalition that was recently um, developed called the Ocean Hill Brownsville Equity Coalition 
that had been doing a number of uh, town halls around things like public um, or police uh, policing in our communities, like what policing uh, could look like in, in kind of like um, atmosphere where we want a, a, a lighter touch. <laughs> um, if you consider again what I was talking about, about um, stop and frisk, um, uh, as well as just like the nature of police brutality in, in, in across the nation. Um, but also, you know, for around um, health and environmental justice policies. Most recently, uh, a Brownsville Residence Green Committee has been started um, in response to something that I, I had heard about through the grapevines. A friend of mine had brought to my attention um, that there, you know, uh, a gas company was putting a pipeline uh, right under us and going to charge us for that pipeline of gas that wasn't even going to serve our community. Um, and so like having to like respond to that with the cons consortium building each of these things and then you know getting our group involved in and in, in getting folks in, um, to oppose those types of actions um, so every, everything happens we we and so we support those types of initiatives and and i'm i partake as board members and active members of all these types of things and i think it's really about organizing and across uh, organizations if we all have a shared goal uh, of spatial justice, environmental justice, um, and criminal justice. Thank you. Do we have any more questions from students? I have another from faculty in the chat, but I wanted to give you guys a chance if you had questions for Cordine about YDC or his work or how he ended up doing this and making it work and how you might make a living. Um, doing community activism. Anybody? I think, uh, all right, we have two, um, Ben Shortcliffe and Kimberly Theracore both have questions. If you guys, if Ben, do you wanna ask yours first? You were in the chat first, and then Kimberly after him. Or Ben, do you want me to ask it for you? Or can you, let me see if I can, un I can unmute you. Awesome, I'm unmuted. Hey, um, thank you so much. All the work is inspiring and I could definitely, you know, when I teach uh, urban design studios, I push my students so hard to do the work that you're in, your inspirational work. It's just, I love it. Um, my questions are first, <clears throat> how long did it take for YDC to actually get like the community buy-in from the young people where they trusted you? And then the second part was, as faculty, we rarely have a chance to be embedded this long term into something. Um, and do you work? Do you like working with universities, or do you, at this point, sort of steer away from it? Um, so the community buy-in piece. Um, um, so be, yeah, just because we did, I think that initial scoping of understanding. It's, it's, it's essentially we did the market research up front. <laughs> like we, we understood that that was a need um, that we would be serving and filling a gap for. So um, there was not much pushback to us occupying the space. You know, my personal narrative um, around, you know, started why I started the organization and, and me being the person to lead that organization are, were in alignment with, with that and, and you know because there has been a history of, of uh, organizations that when they get funding they'll they'll or get they they get funding on behalf of Brownsville to do the work in Brownsville, but they might be larger organizations and um, and once they don't have that funding anymore they leave. I think that narr that narrative of bitterness that <laughs> builds in people and um, and so it's it feels better. To have it be homegrown and grassroots, so they can know that it's not going to just up and leave because priorities change. So, so that's been helped. And then there's the the economic benefit of uh, you know capturing retail leakage. The before before this, a lot of folks were just like, where do I go for a graphic designer? Where do I go um, when I need like an architectural design for this kind of like community garden that I'm doing? What, where do I go for? These types of things, and, and we've captured some of that retail leakage and, and turned it into dollars for for local folks. So it's it's a very it's it's not hard to to to, to get people on board when you're paying them. <laughs> That's for sure. Um, 
and the piece around uh, the school, you said the schools, um, oh, institutional uh, engagement. Um, so I, I found that, um, you know, there's benefits to, uh, and, and downsides to everything. I think the, one of the most fruitful studios that we did uh, that was with when I was teaching at, um, at City College and it, it produced the, the friendship benches. Um, the uh, the Osborne puzzle, the ones that were seesaws and things of that nature, you know. Whereas um, we're not always able to work with the young people to actually build those things um, by hand. They'll they'll engage touch points of it, but I think it's the more so the re realization of their ideas um, and the big the the being able to have the brushstroke to edit out or, or reconceive of everything, like them being in the the client position and understanding that they have the final say of everything and if it and and, and also just being able to judge the success of the thing in the, in the space if it's not going to work they'll remove it right they're saying that this is not they have that authority they have the keys they have the power and i think that that's a more important relationship to 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 a um a, 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 a vendor like a provider of, of services like an institute you know, schools are schools are businesses at the end of the day um you know and uh, you know, kind of like students are, are able to help for that business of, of education and, um, and realization of, of, of projects or research. And, and I think that there's a benefit to on both ends, like we need the hands to, to build sometimes and, and, and they, need, they want the experience. So one hand washes the other. Thank you. Um, Kimberly, you had a question, I'm gonna unmute. Hi, thanks so much uh, for your lecture. And I'm one of Ken Frampton's students and it was awesome to see you bringing him back to Brownsville. This is like his first built American project, first and only, I think. You didn't come to Brownsville, we went uh, to Brownsville. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> but it's nice to see you kind of question him all these years later because I think that project for him is an abstraction and not, not a real place still. But I, I wanted to ask a question that maybe is self-serving to the department, but you know, these students are getting excited about design and maybe they're future architects or future landscape architects or urbanists. And you know, as a department, we really want to welcome diverse students and black students in particular, I think from American cities. And it's really hard to get them to think about coming to Iowa State. And, you know, especially from New York City, like the idea that you'd leave New York and come out to the Midwest to study architecture, I think is not something there that's top of mind for the students, but we have resources and scholarships and like the faculty here would really love to have more students who, who come from this context. And I guess I'm just curious what you think, having gone to school in a very white place, even if it's not a white city, a white school, how we as a department where the faculty are majority white faculty who really want to work with students of color, you know, Latino students, black students, indigenous students, how do we make it a comfortable place when those students need to come into an environment that the appearance of the environment is very white? How, how do we kind of bridge that gap so that they know that they're welcome and they know they're going to have a good experience with us, even if we ourselves don't represent all of those diverse populations? That is the question. I the, the 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 I think one thing that I tell our corporate partners is it's a it's a process of self interrogation of, of understanding the um, what the space does right like and, and it's just you know the same thing as, as as it relates to the spaces we create the architectures that we put into the world like understanding kind of like when it's static what what does it do what it what does this um, what are people's relationships to this space and how um, how does it organically uh, create or not create um, so, um, space uh, and then you know using that as a point of departure to in, in the interrogation of, of ways in which it can do something else and, um, and I think that I, my biggest the thing I advocate more most for is just the the conversations and the the surveying and the um, but the deep knowledge the, the gathering uh, from the constituents that you both have and and might not have 
to be able to, to interrogate how um, you might serve them better. Um, I, you know, I, in terms of like reach or aware, awareness, I think that, you know, for a lot of the young people that uh, we're engaging, we're the first point of contact for, uh, you know, black architect that they're ever meeting. And um, I didn't meet a black architect until I was about 20 years old. <laughs> you know, and I had been in school for like three years. So it, um, for uh, in, in, in undergraduate. So, you know, I think that that's, that's a, a barrier that we're working to, to, to alleviate in terms of like, when you Google um, architecture, <laughs> um, you don't see many, very many black architects. Um, and, and then when you Google architecture schools, you see a certain number or lists of architecture schools, right? And I think that that's probably not helping in your diversity either, right? So I, I think that that's a, to the, to the extent that like, for, for me, I felt I needed to go to um, certain schools in order to compete um, as a black architect in a space. And, and that kind of like wipes out some options. I have one last question. We're mostly out of time, but I'm gonna pull it out of the chat because I'm, I'm curious as well. Um, we have a lot of students who would like careers in tactical urbanism and community design and the things that you're talking about. So if you were graduating in 2021 into the post pandemic, hopefully post pandemic world, um, what would be your advice to someone who wants to pursue this way of working? Um, <clears throat> just, you know, I think the, the thing that has guided me most is, is understanding um, what the what the North Star is and and, um, and being passionate about it. So I, I think the, the the way of working, particularly uh, around kind of like, you know, it's twofold. One is just basically grant writing, you know, full time to be able to accomplish some of the goals, but you have to in tandem um, uh, pilot something do something, um, fill the, fill, I, I, the way that I entered the space was I aligned myself with the organization that was already working with the youth population and I offered something that they needed. Um, so, you know, not having to build your own infrastructure um, to, to be able to bring up a, a program that they would value and be able to implement um, is, a, is a way to start and to get a, 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 a case study that you can show then to funders to support the work that you want to do. Um, Cause for the, we, we're, we're nine years old this year. We didn't start the creative apprenticeship program until three years ago. For the first couple of years, we were just working as a consultant for another organization, right? So the creative apprenticeship program is fully funded by us and our funders for the past three years only. Um, but in the first other, the other years, or most of the projects that you saw um, today were from the first four years. All right, so um, you have to, you. Have, to, you have to do that to get to, yeah. <laughs> to where we want to go. So patience and looking at a longer arc um, and partnering with existing infrastructure might be some takeaways. Nine years is a, you've been, wor you've been working in Made in Brownsville and YDC basically since you finished graduate school. So I think for all of you. Last year was the first year we, we finally broke the million dollar mark. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, congratulations on all of your work and thank you so much for sharing it with us. If everyone can give Courtney another round of applause, um, hopefully one day we can actually show you around Ames. Um, thank you for joining us. I know Ames was on your like top 10 list of places to visit. Um, I'm coming to see you. Um, so thank you so much. And um, that's it. Thank you everyone for joining us. Everyone has to run off to see.